Um, okay, welcome everybody to the weekly Freyland Biomedical Research Institute Pioneers in Biomedical Research Seminar. Welcome to people online. Are there people online, Brent? Okay, welcome people online, wherever you are. Uh, so it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, our speaker who, by the way, attended our big celebration event last night. It was wonderful to have, have her be part of that uh, wonderful evening we all had. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Zheng Li uh, is here. She is the Senior Investigator and in Chief of the Section on Synapse Development and Plasticity at the National Institute of Mental Health at NIH. Uh, she did her graduate work, her PhD, uh, at SUNY Stony Brook, but actually working at Cold Spring Harbor with Holly Klein at the time, but getting her degree from State University of New York at Stony Brook, and then went to MIT for her postdoctoral work with Morgan Sheng. And then from there, she went on to the NIMH to become a, a staff scientist and then rose up to become a section chief, as I uh, recently described. Her graduate work with uh, with uh, Holly Klein involved, uh, of course, Xenopus uh, and studying um, roles of uh, uh, rho GDP, GDPAs and dendritic growth in uh, Xenopus. And she also did some really cool um, uh, technology development while with Holly, uh, working on single cell electroporation for gene transfer at the time as well. When she went on to MIT to do her postdoctoral work with uh, Morgan Sheng, she focused on and got her interest going, I think, in mitochondria and uh, studying dendritic mitochondria's role in spine and synapse plasticity in particular. And then when she got to the NIMH and uh, setting up her own lab and so forth, she's continued her interest in mitochondria, studying uh, 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 a variety of things, including autophagosomes, uh, autophagosomes and mitophagosomes, She's been interested in plasticity at all levels, particularly NMDA receptors role uh, in uh, stress-induced aggression behavior and the underlying neurobiology of that. And it's had some really cool models looking at the role of aversive uh, early social experience on anxiety and the role of mitophagy in that as well, which I think we might hear something about today. Uh, she's been uh, really, I think, a pioneer, an important contributor in the world of microRNAs. Uh, and their role in a variety of aspects of synaptic function and plasticity, including LTP maintenance and spine uh, function, and has also uh, gone on to increase our understanding of the connection between the function of mitochondria and higher level functions that relate to neural circuits and behavior as well. And she just shared with me some really exciting work she's doing in a, a model of uh, uh, irritability, I think it is, that is now in the DSM-5 in clinical psychiatry and has a really interesting, it sounds like animal model, but I know we're not going to hear about that. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Lee. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, Mike, for this very uh, kind introduction. Oh, there we go. So uh, it's, really, uh, it's really my honor to be here, and it's my great pleasure to share my research with uh, the uh, people here. And it's, uh, also, it's a really surprising, pleasant surprise last night to attend this uh, seasonal party, which is really great, fantastic. I learned all these you know, great achievements happening here, uh, really. Congratulations. <laughs> OK. So, um, okay, so today I'm going to share with you our research. Like Mike has said, um, uh, D-Heart, we are really interested in synapses. In particular, we are interested in the molecular and the cellular mechanisms underlying synapse development and the plasticity. So since I work uh, at NIH in the last, past 16 years, we have been focusing on mitochondria-mediated mechanisms. And today I'm going to talk about uh, several uh, functions of mitochondria that we have been involved to study uh, related to synapses. So uh, as you can see from the title, they are related to uh, synaptic plasticity, uh, neurosynchronization, and anxiety. So first off, um, when we talk about mitochondria, it's obvious to everyone. Mitochondria are the cellular power plants, and they provide energy to cells, in particular eukaryotic cells. And we know energy is very important. Um, energy is important for our life. So if there's blackout, we will lose lighting, cooling, and heating, among many other modern conveniences. So some people will become very anxious. So when the brain is short of energy, uh, it really have very negative impact on the brain function. And in is an extreme case, brain cells can die. So this is because the brain is heavily dependent on mitochondria. The brain is only 2% of body weight, but it consumes 20% of energy we use. 
and 90% uh, of uh, the energy used in the brain is provided by mitochondria. So we know the brain is uh, comprised of uh, neural circuits, which is made up by neurons. And the most uh, energy consuming activity in the brain is the synaptic transmission, which is the basic function for the brain to carry out all the sophisticated cognitive, emotional, and behavior functions. So, and these functions are powered by mitochondria. So this is a typical mitochondria one can uh, see. Um, uh, mitochondria are double membrane structures. So the, all the mitochondrial membranes separate mitochondria from the rest of the cell. And on the inner mitochondrial membrane, there are uh, several big protein complexes that are involved in uh, rest of oxidative phosphorylation. And this oxidative phosphorylation uh, produce uh, uh, proton um, gradient across the mitochondrial membrane to generate mitochondrial membrane potential, which is uh, the driving force for ATP production. So mitochondrial membrane potential is often used as indicator of mitochondrial respiration. Um, in the cell, mitochondria exist as these individual structures. Um, so uh, in addition to provide um, power, they also um, buffer into cellular calcium, and they can also participate in apoptosis. I will come back to the, uh, this apoptotic function later. So um, there are uh, thousands of mitochondria in the cell. Mitochondria are dynamic structures. They move around. They can also divide, and they can also fuse with each other. Mitochondrial fusion and fission are important for mitochondrial homeostasis, mitochondrial biogenesis. Damaged mitochondria can be uh, removed through a process called mitophagy to maintain mitochondrial quality. So mitochondria perhaps is the most abundant organelles in neurons. They are um, distributed throughout the cell. So this is a hippocampal neuron in which mitochondria are labeled by fluorescent proteins. These vesicular and tubular structures, mitochondria, they have high density in the cell body. They also distribute throughout axons and dendrites. And the electron microscopy, mitochondria can be detected in presynaptic terminals and also in postsynaptic terminals. So, and um, mitochondria are very important, play key roles in many uh, aspects of mitochondria uh, of synaptic function. For instance, it can provide um, energy to support synaptic activity, can modulate synaptic transmission by uh, buffering presynaptic calcium. They are required for dendritic spine development. And um, these functional mitochondria have been implicated in neurodegeneration and neuropsychiatric disorders. So mitochondria is no doubt very important for synapses. On the other hand, mitochondria are also regulated by synaptic activity. Um, so many groups, including us, have shown that the motility and the subcellular distribution and the function of mitochondria can be regulated by synaptic activity. Um, for instance, this is a work we uh, have done many years ago. We found that synaptic uh, excitation can change the um, distribution of mitochondria in dendrites. So uh, the majority of mitochondria are found to, uh, in the uh, dendritic shaft. Uh, but there is a small percentage of dendritic spines they contain mitochondria. And interestingly, we found that if we stimulate synapses to promote LTP and enlargement dendritic spines, we can uh, change mitochondria location. So for instance, these uh, synapses are stimulated with high frequency stimulation to induce a spine enlargement before and after they grow bigger. At the same time, we found that mitochondria originally in the dendritic shaft, they uh, infiltrate these enlarged dendritic spines. And this mitochondria translocation um, are associated with the morphogenesis of dendritic spines. In addition to um, be um, connected to spine um, morphogenesis, um, over the years, we found that mitochondria really have multifaceted functions in synapses. And today I'm going to uh, talk about the three um, things uh, which we found about mitochondria in synapses. So the first one is the uh, role of mitochondria in um, synaptic plasticity. And this one is particularly mediated 
the mitochondria caspase autophagy pathway. So these are the um, postdoc fellows and the staff scientists in my lab who have um, done this work. Um, so um, when we talk about the mitochondrial apoptosis pathway, many of you know that this is a canonical cell death pathway. So this pathway is activated uh, during development or under pathological conditions to eliminate um, unwanted cells. So um, one of the um, cell death pathway is mediated by mitochondria. That's inducing stimuli can cause permeabilization of mitochondria or the membrane which leads to the release of cytochrome C into the cytosol, where cytochrome C will bind to ATP, APOP1, procastase 9 to form apoptosomes. Um, Caspase 9 is cleave and activate in apoptosomes, then active Caspase 9 will cleave and activate uh, Caspase 3. So Caspase 3 is so-called executioner Caspase. Once it's activated, it will cleave all kinds of cellular substrates to dismantle the cell. Mitochondria can also release uh, other factors. They bind to the inhibitors of caspases to indirectly activate caspases. So this is canonical cell death pathway and caspase activation is uh, uh, commonly used as hallmark of cell death. But um, people also found active caspases in non-apoptotic cells, uh, including um, mammalian cells. Um, and in different species, and uh, people have found non-apoptotic functions of caspases. For instance, in uh, Drosophila, caspase can regulate the sperm differentiation, neural precursor development, and sensory neuron dendritic pruning. In T cells and B cells, caspase can aid is involved in the proliferation and differenti differentiation of cells. In Xenopus, caspase uh, is involved in the chemotropic response act of axonal growth cones. So many years ago, motivated by this, non apoptotic functions or caspases, um, we started to ask if caspases have non apoptotic functions in synapses. In particular, in particularly, we care about synaptic plasticity. We studied synaptic plasticity in hippocampal uh, slices. So hippocampal, the hippocampus perhaps is uh, the most studied area for synaptic plasticity. Uh, this is because this, you know, this uh, neat trisynaptic um, circuit and the lamina structure of hippocampus are very convenient for electrophysiological recordings. So basically, we uh, recorded from C1 neurons and we elicited um, synaptic responses by stimulating the shift of collateral pathway, which is a connection between the CS3 and the C1 region. In the hippocampus, we can also um, express genes of interest to uh, visualize uh, neurons, mitochondria, or study gene functions. So to ask if caspases have non-apoptotic functions in synapses, synaptic plasticity, we um, look at um, synaptic plasticity in caspase 3 knockout mice. So uh, we made hippocampal slices from knockout mice, and then uh, when we stimulated uh, the slices with low-frequency stimulation, we can induce LTD. Um, in the wild type slices, which is fine, normal. However, in a caspase with knockout mice, we cannot induce LTD. But when we use high frequency stimulation to induce LTP, this is comparable in both wild type and caspase 3 knockout mice. So it appears that caspase 3 is required for LTD, but not LTP. We also tested a few other caspases and we found that only caspase 3 and caspase 9 the two caspases which are activated by the mitochondria pathway are required for LTD. So these findings really point to the role of mitochondria pathway in um, LTD. Since this is the major um, mitochondria caspase pathway in hippocampal neurons. So basically mitochondria um, are activated by the BCL2 family proteins BAD and BACs um, in the um, apoptosis. So bad is cytosolic protein. During apoptosis, bad will translocate to mitochondria where it will uh, activate the BACs. BACs can form pores of mitochondria, therefore uh, cause mitochondrial membrane um, permeabilization cytochrome C release. So um, because of the um, um, involvement caspase 3 and caspase 9 in LTD, so we ask if this pathway is involved in um, LTD production. Um, then, um, so then we look at um, 
LTD in bat and bax knockout mice. So in the knockout mice, uh, similar to caspase 3 knockout mice, LTD cannot be induced, um, but LTP is normal, uh, which uh, indicate that this um, bad bax um, mitochondria pathway is indeed required for LTD induction. Next, we ask how this pathway is engaged in LTD, and after this pathway is activated, how caspase induces LTD. So um, low-frequency induced LTD in the hippocampus is dependent on AMD receptors. So basically, after AMD receptors are activated, calcium enters the cell to activate um, calcium-dependent protein phosphatases, calcineurin and PD-1. And then these phosphatases will uh, increase amper receptor internalization, therefore reducing the abundance of amper receptors on post synaptic membrane to weaken synaptic strength. So this type of MD receptor dependent LTD um, can be induced by learning and it's involved in learning memory, um, behavior flexibility, novelty, acquisition, um, etc. And we look at uh, this. Um, uh, um, what happened to this mitochondria pathway after AMD receptor activation. And then it turns out um, after AMD receptors are activated, there's a, a decrease in phosphorylated BAD. So BAD is a dephosphorylated. And this dephosphorylation is uh, um, uh, blocked by um, PP1 inhibitor ocatic acid and calcineurin inhibitor FK506. So they are mediated by uh, these two phosphatases. Um, and furthermore, we found that our uh, MD receptor activation increased the um, BAD on mitochondria. So this um, data suggests that um, the protein phosphatases, they can defrosted the BAD and then tr uh, BAD translocates mitochondria to activate mitochondria pathway. So now we um, solve the upstream signaling. Then what happened to um, after caspase 3 activation? So caspase 3 is an enzyme. Presumably, active caspase 3 will cleave many proteins, and some of the protein may uh, be involved in LTD. So therefore, we uh, use proteomics to look at caspase 3 substrates, which are cleaved in LTD. We also look into literature for known caspase 3 substrates, and we tested a few caspases, uh, caspase substrates. And it turns out, um, the caspase substrate that has the most um, significant effect on LTD are in the autophagy pathway. So autophagy is a cellular degradation pathway. It's involved in the removal of cellular waste. Um, basically, autophagy uh, starts with the formation of a, a double membrane structure, which is called a phagophore, surrounding the cargoes to be degraded. The phagophore then uh, extend and enclose to form autophagosome, autophagosome uh, fused with lysosome to form autophagal lysosome to degrade the cargo. Autophagy is regulated by more than 30 proteins. And it turns out several of these are ATG proteins are caspase substrates. So that made me us think that when caspase 3 is activated in LTD, it can cleave these autophagy, sub autophagy proteins, thereby uh, leading to um, inhibition of autophagy. To test this uh, hypothesis, we look at autophagy in hippocampal neurons uh, when we stimulated them to undergo LTD. So um, this is the way we look at autophagy. So we uh, transfect the hippocampal neurons with um, rp tag LC3. LC3 is also called ATG8. Um, it is a protein which is uh, cleaved to become a shorter form, which is called LC3-2, and recruited into um, autophagosome during autophagy. So it's a commonly used marker uh, for autophagy. So we um, look at the neurons before and after low-frequency stimulation. We found that the um, lc 3 panta, which indicate autophagosome, decreased after low-frequency stimulation, <laughs> but they are not changed after high-frequency stimulation. There's also reduction of cleave lc 3 2 So these results um, suggest that autophagy is indeed inhibited. Um, we also look at the PCC2, which is an uh, autophagy-specific um, substrate. There is an increase of PCC2 
after low frequency stimulation, which is consistent with a, a, a reduction of autophagy. So autophagy is inhibited um, in LTD. And these changes in LC3 and PCC2 are blocked by MD receptor antagonist AP5 and Casp3 inhibitor DVD. So autophagy inhibition occurs downstream of MD receptors and Casp3. Sure. So um, is the implication at this point in the early induction process of LTD? Uh, that the autophagy uh, is playing contributory role in the infection process, but not so much in the maintenance process at all. That, that, that's a great question. Yes, from our data suggesting it is involving the early induction uh, phase. There's a other, another group, they also find that, actually there are two groups, one in Japan, one in uh, Europe. They found that um, the later phase of LTD, autophagy actually is increased. And then that increase is involved in the degradation of AMPA receptors. So, and here is also consistent with us. We found that it, we found a transient um, change in autophagy. So within the, the uh, you know, induction phase is that autophagy is inhibited. And I will talk about why it's inhibited and uh, what, what, is, uh, what it does. Yeah, yeah. There's even the phosphorylation of bad is change is transient as well. Yes, exactly. So is that the... <laughs> Really, the gate for all of it is it the bad phosphorylation state, or is it sort of a multi-molecular, yeah, systemic regulation that you have? So, um, the mitochondrial caspase pathway, bad bags, and the caspase that that again is a, is a great point. It is transient. What we find is transient, uh, transient, and also is a level is low. And then, in terms of oh, who is gating this, you know, transient, you no. Know, Dynamics. Um, I think probably it's a calcium, <laughs> um, but we, we haven't directly tested. But this uh, transient uh, activation of this pathway is a key to prevent cell deaths um, to induce LTD. So, so yeah. it's sort of it's protecting the cell from cell death transiently yeah. while LTD is induced, and then it goes back to being a tripwire for if there is a cellular stress thing. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So now, now we find that autophagy it is it is indeed inhibited in LTD. Then we wonder whether this autophagy inhibition is just you know epiphenomenal or it has anything to do with LTD. So um, we uh, did this experiment. So we um, inhibit autophagy reduction by uh, uh, adding rapamycin. So what rapamycin can activate autophagy uh, by uh, no so inhibiting uh, mTOR. So, and then after we uh, added rapamycin, we uh, block autophagy inhibition, at the same time, we block LTD. But many of you know that uh, rapamycin is not really doing only the thing on autophagy. It has many other functions like protein synthesis. So we wonder if this, is, uh, this effect on LTD is uh, mediated by autophagy. So then we uh, use this uh, conditional ATG5 knockout mice. So we use uh, two lines. In one line, ATG5 is now called in the post-synaptic CA1 neurons. In another line, ATG5 is now called in pre-synaptic CA3 neurons. So in the CA3 um, pre-synaptic ATG5 now called mice, rapamycin can still block LTD. But uh, when ATG5 is now called in the pre-synaptic CA1 neurons, um, rapamycin no longer inhibit LTD. So it suggests that is a post-synaptic uh, autophagy that is responsible for the effect of rapamycin. And rapamycin has no effect on LTP. So, so these results are saying that basically autophagy inhibition is required for LTD induction. Uh, next, we ask if autophagy inhibition is sufficient for LTD induction. So what we did is we uh, inhibit autophagy directly using these pharmacological regions without indu uh, delivering low frequency stimulation. So leopeptin and bufflomycin, they inhibit LTD, uh, sorry, inhibit autophagy. At the same time, we induce LTD. So autophagy inhibition also is sufficient for LTD induction. Okay, so now we find autophagy is both necessary and sufficient for LTD induction. Autophagy is degradation pathway. So then one may think that Maybe autophagy in LTD is a no, it's a degradation function. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, can you go back one slide? Sure. So your autophagy, um, 
the leptin is in there the whole time uh, when you're stimulating control conditions, and then does, is that right? So, so here we uh, uh, we added the leptin. Um, we didn't uh, deliver any uh, give, give any stimulation. I just record, and we give um, the pipe in two ways. We added the bus for field recording. We also added to the recording pad for whole cell recording. It's in the cell patch. It's in the cell. In the cell. Yeah. I, I see. Yeah. I see. And you don't. Um, so obviously the kinetics are very different. When you're doing your typical two hertz stimulation, you get that very exponential initial decline, and right. then it either stabilizes the cell to be. Or it goes back to baseline. Right. And you do your sufficiency experiment, dump on the pet, and it's just sort of a, kind of a continuous rundown. Yeah. So, so the question I really want to ask is what if you only put the pet in for the first 10 minutes or something like that? Would it ah. go down and stay nice, or does it have to stay there to maintain? We're back to this issue of what's contributing to maintenance. I see. That's, that, that, that's, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, we, we didn't try that way. Yeah, I think that would be very informative. Yeah, we. And, and does that affect other? I mean, that's a that's a pretty heavy fact. Did sell with washing all of that Are yeah. there are you monitoring other aspects, either electrophysiologically or besides the, the synaptic plasticity of the cells? Of health? Um, so in this case, we didn't really do too many other other manipulations, but we do we do monitor the cell health, for, especially for whole cell. So we look at for um, the cell condition. It's not simple random. So the reason we recorded for so long, so sorry, we want to um, we want to wait until this apply toll. We don't really want to you know. So when this continue to run down, we're not sure if it is the cells you know this run down or is this really LTD. Um, but that that is a good point. We 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 will have a look at other um, parameters. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So back to our question: How really autophagy works in uh, LTD? So it's a degradation pathway. So one may think that's a degradation, and then we we look at you know we did the experiments, and it turns out it's very interesting. The role of autophagy in LTD is not degradation, at least in this induction early phase. It's about it's a control amplifier receptor recycling. So LTD actually uh, the mechanism is mainly um, mediated by the removal of amplifier receptors from synapses. So amplifier receptors are dynamic in and out of synapses, right? So during LTB, they are inserted into synapses and during LTD, they are removed from synapses. So um, the amplifier receptor can be removed from synapses uh, through endocytosis. And then the amplifier receptors are sorted in early endosomes into either recycled endosomes for, re for reinsertion into the plasma membrane, or it can be um, uh, 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 delivered to late endosomes for degradation. And then we find out actually autophagy is uh, um, controlling this uh, recycling step. So basically this is because there is a crosstalk between autophagy biogenesis pathway and uh, endocytic recycling. So autophagosome, as I said more earlier, is a double membrane structure. In order to form autophagosome, first of all, there have to be uh, some membrane source. And one way to get a, a membrane for autophagosome biogenesis is to uh, retrieve membrane from the plasma membrane. And this is uh, the pathway. Um, so plasma membrane containing ATG16L and MATG9 can be um, endocytosed. And then the vesicles containing these two uh, proteins, they fuse in recycling endosomes to form pre precursors of autophagosome. Um, and this um, process can uh, autophagosome biogenesis pathway can facilitate uh, endocytic recycling. So in LTD, when autophagosome uh, autophagy is inhibited, it will lead to the inhibition of autophagosome biogenesis. Okay. Um, question here is, is this specific because of the localization of the, of the genesis of tagapore? Or is it specific because there's a molecular specificity of the bag of four for the recycling in the cell? Um, that's a possibility. Uh, these are initially, so these are um, in this are, um, this is recycling. So these basically these uh, interaction between recycling endosomes and autophagosome biogenesis um, was uh, identified by David Rubin's group, a uh, Rubinstein's group. So they did in the, I forgot the cell, cell line, but they did in the heterologous cells, not neurons. So in that case, it, it's not the neuron specific, it's probably also not uh, local things, yeah.
Right. 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 In neurons, yeah, the, I would say the unpaired receptor part is a problem, perhaps neuron specific, and has something to do with the synapse specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. So here, so when we uh, in LTD, uh, when autopsy is inhibited, there is accumulation of ATG sitting L and MATG9 in recycling zone because of how, uh, autophagosome biogenesis is inhibited. So we we actually found that if we inhibit autophagosome uh, autophagy, we can uh, accumulate uh, MATG9 and ATG cysteine L in recycling endosome, which is labeled by RAB11. And this accumulation of these proteins uh, in recycling endosome cause uh, inhibition of endocytic recycling. So there's reduction of RAB11 labeled um, in uh, recycling endosomes. Therefore, there is inhibition of ampericept recycling by, back to the synapses, and for, which is facilitating the reduction of ampericeptors from synapses. So this is what we think that what is happening in the post-synaptic site by interacting with uh, ampericeptor recycling. This uh, autophagy is uh, uh, involved in the LTD uh, induction. And uh, furthermore, we found that this mitochondria caspase autophagy pathway can also have functions in presynaptic side. So basically, this pathway presynaptic, they can control uh, the uh, number of synaptic vesicles. Um, in bad backs and caspase knockout mice, there is an increase of autophagy in presynaptic neurons, which leads to the uh, reduction of uh, uh, synaptic vesicles, both in the duct um, synaptic vesicles and the reserve pools. And this deep fat can be um, reversed by uh, inhibiting autophagy with a chloroquine. Um, so this is the model. So uh, what happens in presynaptic lay? So uh, caspase 3 control autophagy activity, um, and autophagy can remove um, damaged or um, um, uh, synaptic vesicles. When autophagy is increased, there is over uh, elimination of synaptic vesicles. OK, so um, now to summarize the first part, uh, of our findings, we found that this um, mitochondria caspase pathway is uh, repurposed uh, in synapses to have a synaptic functions. So uh, first of all, this pathway can be engaged uh, post-synaptically to uh, mediate the induction of uh, um, LTD. And also presynaptically, this pathway uh, can control the number of synaptic vesicles. So this is one uh, function of uh, um, mitochondria in presynaptically uh, in synapses. Now I'm going to move to the second part of, of my talk, which is about this mitochondria um, in uh, neural synchronization, in particular synchronization at uh, via uh, gamma oscillations, and this is uh, related to mitochondria fission. And these are the these work are conducted by uh, these uh, postdoc and staff scientists in my lab. So basically. Um, so now we um, study the, why we study gamma oscillations. So like I mentioned earlier, synaptic transmission is the most energy consuming activity in the brain. And the amount of ATP required for synaptic transmission is a positive, positively correlates with the uh, frequency of synaptic transmission. High frequency synaptic transmission requires more ATP. And gamma oscillation is type of high frequency synchronized population activity, activity of neurons. Um, uh, gamma oscillations have been detected in many brain regions, and they analyze the uh, precise timing of neural um, spiking and um, coherent binding of neural ensemble during cognitive processes. And also, it's very interesting that gamma oscillations um, abnormalities have been found in um, brains of people with psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia. So we people know that um, gamma oscillation requires strong mitochondrial functions. For instance, if mitochondria uh, respiration is inhibited, there's a reduction of gamma oscillations. And it's, it's also, there's a consensus that uh, um, gamma oscillations re, you know, require a lot of ATP energy. However, it's not clear how this uh, um, energy challenge is resolved in, gamma, uh, in, uh, in neurons. So with this question in mind, uh, we look at mitochondria um, in neurons when neurons undergo um, gamma uh, frequency activities. 
So here we stimulate neurons with uh, forty hertz stimulation, which is within gamma range, and then we look at mitochondria, and we found that after stimulation, there is an increase of mitochondria fission over time. At the same time, we found that there is an um, increase of DRP1 protein on mitochondria. So DRP1 is a key protein involving mitochondria fission. Uh, DRP1 basically is a large GTPase, a, 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 a translocated mitochondria from oligomers on mitochondria uh, to median mitochondria fission. So the increase of DRP1 on mitochondria is, is consistent with the increased fission. And uh, also we, we found that um, there is more mitochondria uh, in the uh, vicinity of a post-synaptic density after stimulation. So it appears that uh, during gamma oscillation, uh, mitochondria fission increase and the mitochondria move closer to synapses. So first I'll look at how this happened uh, in terms of signaling. And then it turns out uh, one protein, which is called the distrobriving binding protein or disbinding for short, is a, a molecule that is important for this process. So this binding is a um, subunit of a, a biogenesis of lysosome-related organelle complex or block one complex. It's interesting that this binding uh, has been associated with uh, schizophrenia risk in early um, uh, genetic linkage studies, although um, this binding is not um, a schizophrenia risk gene in the recent GWAS uh, studies. Nevertheless, we found that um, so during gamma oscillations, um, this binding, um, and this is one isoform this binding called this binding 1C. Uh, this binding 1C translocate to mitochondria where it binds to DRP1 and the receptor for DRP1 mate 49 and then mate 51. Um, and the binding of this binding 1C to these proteins promotes DRP1 oligomerization mitochondria, therefore increase mitochondria fission. And after fission, so mitochondria fission creates two daughter mitochondria, but these two daughter mitochondria are not equal. One tend to, usually one have a higher metabolic function, the other has a lower function. And then the ones that are higher among a function um, uh, translocate you know, to the place close to PSD to boost the energy supply to synapses to support uh, gamma oscillations. And then um, we, when we look at mice, which has this binding uh, mutant, um, this is a disbinding uh, non-mutant mice, which is called a sandy mice because they have a light for color. We found that mitochondria morphology is different. So mitochondria become longer in these sandy mice. And this is because there's an inhibition of mitochondria fission. Fission rate is reduced. Um, and then we look at if these uh, mice have a, a no changes in gamma oscillations and the behavior related to gamma oscillations. So we recorded uh, from the hippocampus in the uh, in these mice, and then we um, uh, to um, look at gamma oscillations when the mice undergo a no novel object recognition task. So because it's known that when the mice uh, interact with novel object, they will uh, increase gamma oscillations. So basically, so, so this is the task we um, expose the mice to two identical items. Once the mice are familiarized with the two items, we replace one. Uh, uh, object with a novel object. So the mice can recognize novel objects and they spend more time with the novel object. And then when they do this, um, there's an increase of gamma oscillations. So this is the um, um, power uh, density of uh, local field potentials recorded from hippocampus. Zero is the time when the mice start to interact with the object. When the mice uh, interact with the novel object, there's an increase of uh, power in the gamma range. However, this increase is uh, not observed in the sandy mice. Um, at the same time, um, so the, uh, the wild-type mice uh, spend more time with the novel object, but um, the sandy mice do not. So the sandy mice has impairment in gamma oscillations and novel object recognition. So next we tested, uh, we want to know if this um, change in gamma oscillations and the behavior are uh, related to mitochondrial fission. So to address this question, we uh, develop a light-induced mitochondrial fission enhancer. So this enhancer is based on light-induced interaction between CRY2 and CIB1. So these two proteins undergo uh, conformational change in the presence of light, so they can bind to each other. We fuse DRP1 to these two proteins, and in the present blue light, DRP1 uh, oligomerized on mitochondria to increase mitochondrial fission. We express this 
um, enhancer in the in the mouse brain, and we and we can use blue light to rescue gamma oscillations in sandy mice, and then also rescue their ob novel object recognition. So, uh, so it appears that mitochondria fission is indeed um, underlying the impairment of uh, uh, gamma oscillations and novel object recognitions in the sandy mice. So this result um, suggests that uh, mitochondrial fission is a cellular mechanism used by gamma oscillations to increase ATP supply uh, to um, pro uh, provide for uh, high frequency synaptic activity. Sorry. 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 Okay. Does that happen in other <clears throat> other <laughs> mechanisms where activity goes up? For example, in seizure, is there a, a correlation with mitochondrial fission and seizure, whether induced by I don't know metrazole or? That's a good question. I know I know people in the seizure they look at the, the during the seizure there's an increase in mitochondrial function, but we haven't looked at the seizure. Uh, yeah, in mitochondrial fission. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, move to the last part of my talk which is about the real mitochondria in psychological stress-induced anxiety. So uh, the motivation of this work is that um, mitochondria abnormalities, you know, either the change in structure function and uh, um, morphology, you know, uh, gene expression have often been observed in the people uh, with psychiatric disorders. Um, so this is well-known observation, but it's unclear if this is the mitochondria pathology is a uh, consequence of the disease or it has active role in the psychopathology. So we are really interested in this question. And we want to um, look this, um, address this question in the mice. And then also we are very interested in uh, the stress, the effect of stress on neurons. So especially psychological stress. So psychological stress is a common genetic environmental risk factor for psychiatric disorders. It often precedes onset of uh, psychiatric disorders. So um, it induces all kinds of uh, psychopathology, including anxiety and depression. So um, then we want to know if um, mitochondria has anything to do with psychological stress induced induce behavior uh, changes. So to do this, we use a chronic social defeat model because you know, in, in, in human psychological stress, essential in nature is a social. So in this model, we um, put the two mice in the same cage. And for most of the day, the two mice they are, um, they are separated by a partition of place in the middle. So one mouse is a bigger and aggressive, another one is a smaller, non-aggressive. So most of these, they can see and smell each other, each other but they cannot directly physical, inter, physically interact. For five to 10 days of each day, we remove the partitioner so they can um, interact. And then during this time, the larger one will attack the smaller one. And this is really dramatic uh, effect. And then we, we do this for, uh, for uh, 10 to 10 days to 30 days. Uh, the mice are really, really, the smaller ones really, really defeated. They show um, all kinds of behavior um, changes. So they show, they show social avoidance. Normally a mouse like to uh, prefer to interact with another mouse than an object. But this time the mouse, the defeated mice show social avoidance. They avoid another mouse. They show, they show uh, increase in anxiety in the open field test and in the LIDAR box test. They also show increased behavior dispire in the uh, full swim test. So it has really has a strong, robust behavior uh, effect. Then um, also, and we found that um, the longer treatment, 30 day CSD exposure causes a um, higher level of behavior change. So it increased um, uh, social avoidance, increased anxiety, and only 30 days um, CSD will uh, cause a significant uh, behavior dispire. Okay, so now the behavior has effect. Now we want to look at mitochondria. So we look at mitochondria in the prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, and the medulla because of these uh, re different regions are involved in the uh, emotion regulation and the stress response. And then, um, and then I'm only showing the uh, no, hippocampus in this data. So, so first time we look at the the brain of the mice, which have been exposed to CSD for 10 days. And then we look at mitochondria um, morphology. So to do this, we use uh, uh, the mitotic mice, which express YP, uh, mito YP mice, which express YP in neurons. So there's no uh, change in mitochondrial area or total mitochondria um, a mass. Uh, we also look at mitochondrial transmembrane potential with a TMRE uh, uptake. So TMRE is uh, taking up 
by mitochondria based on mitochondrial memory potential. And also there's no difference between uh, is, uh, control and CSD mice. We also use a genetic encoded ATP sensor to look at ATP uh, in the cell. Also, again, there's no difference. So it looks like mitochondria are okay, normal in these uh, mice. However, when we look at the mice which have been exposed to CSD for 30 days, the picture is very different. So uh, this is the uh, in the amygdala, there is a reduction of a TMRE um, uptake. There is a decrease in cytochrome C oxidase activity. There is a decrease in ATP production. And interestingly, these changes in mitochondria is a selective to uh, amygdala. Uh, in the hippocampus, we don't see significant change in this mitochondria measurement. Um, and then, um, so it appears that mitochondria are uh, changed by the CSE in the amygdala. So mitochondria um, depolarization is often a sign of mitochondria damage. And then damaged mitochondria can be, uh, usually is removed by mitophagy to maintain you know, mitochondrial health. This is uh, um, the, you know, the best study, the mitophagy pathway. So basically when the mitochondria are depolarized, uh, pink one protein accumulate on dam damaged mitochondria. Pink one is a uh, kinase, it will facilitate the parking and ubiquitin to tag damaged mitochondria for metophagy. Because we find mitochondrial depolarization, so we wonder whether this uh, pathway is activated. And then we look at um, um, LC3 on mitochondria. We also look at op optineurin, which is a um, mitochondria specific receptor for autophagy. And we found in both cases, there's an increase of LC3 and optineurin on mitochondria, which suggests that mitophagy is increased. Yeah. Once again, this brings up the so with the AMPA receptor and the zone story, is there a ubiquitination required for? the phagophore to recognize those guys, or is that a ubiquitination independent of it? That, yeah. that, that's a good question. Um, we didn't look at that. We didn't look at the amperoceptor uh, degradation in the papers. No, they do look at amperoceptor degradation. They also didn't look at the ubiquitin pathway. So they find there's a change in uh, um, amperoceptor amounts, but they didn't uh, look at the mechanism. Yes, yeah. That may be actually a, a hypothesis of the, a different toggle for yeah. doing this, which is more long-term versus doing short-term. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's certainly it's possible, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so here we find evidence for um, mitophagy increase in these defeated mice, and then we further confirm this, we use EM, so this is an EM, we look at uh, these are double memory structures, which are metal, metal uh, um, metaphagosome-like structures. There's an increase of these kind of structures. We also look at uh, general autophagy. So this is uh, um, autophagy, autophagosome-like structure, there's no change. And LC3 and PCS2 is also no change. So there's no um, global increase of autophagy. It looks like mitophagy is selected increase in these defeated mice. Um, and as a result of this increase in mitophagy, there is a reduction of mitochondria. Um, so here again in these metal YP mice, we look at overall mitochondria mount. There's a reduction of um, mitochondria. Again, this is a selective to um, amygdala. In the hippocampus, there's no change in mitochondria. Does that induce in any way a compensatory change in the function of the surviving mitochondria? Yes, yes, exactly. That is coming. Yeah, so so what, okay, so now we look at um, this uh, um, mitochondria in these knockout mice, like exactly like you said. So um, there is a reduction, there's a uh, damage mitochondria, reduction mitochondria function, and the uh, metabolism at the same time is increased as a compensation for this uh, uh, re reduced mitochondria function. So then the, the two um, factors combine together to keep overall mitochondria function still in this uh, reasonable level. So the, in the knockout mice, the, the mice can maintain the overall mitochondria function and uh, um, uh, behavior, uh, no, correct. What is the same impact between the number of mitochondria? 
functionality of the other mitochondria? How do they how do they know to compensate for that? What's the what's the communication? That's a very interesting question. Yes. <laughs> we also want to know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay, so then we look at this pink uh, pink one parking pathway in this uh, um um, in these mice, we, we look at the pink one parking knockout mice. We knock out these um, proteins in these uh, uh, mice, and we found that um, mitophagy is a block in these mice. Um, but when we look at a mitochondrial membrane, membrane potential, they are still depolarized. So mitochondria is still damaged. So mitophagy is a downstream of mitochondria damage. But as a, because of this um, block of mitophagy, uh, it can compensate for the decreased mitochondrial function. So then when we look at the overall mitochondrial function or overall mitochondrial amount that is uh, um, um, rescued in these knockout mice. And uh, um, also, um, then we look at the behavior of these mice, um, anxiety increase in the, in the multi-mice induced by the CSD is a block in the knockout mice, but interestingly, behavior despite and the social avoidance are still present in the defeated mice. So we think that this um, different effect on behavior is because um, the depression and the social interaction are mainly mediated by other brain regions like prefrontal cortex and striatum, like reported by uh, Eric Nessler and other groups. Uh, and then we, don't, we find this uh, uh, CSD has a selective effect um, amygdala. Maybe it's because of this uh, primarily a fear, um, and amygdala is uh, uh, processing uh, the hub for fear. So that's that's maybe that's the reason we we see selective effect on anxiety. Okay, then how does um, um, mitochondria um, change in amygdala affect anxiety? So um, we look at the anxiety pathway uh, in amygdala. This is a pathway that have been identified um, several years ago by the uh, Caldezero's group. Uh, so they found that uh, from amygdala, there's a projection to the um, anterior dorsal part of a bad nucleus of stria terminalis. And this pathway has angiolytic effect. When this pathway is activated, actually it suppresses anxiety. And we found mitochondria is reducing the amygdala and presumably uh, synaptic transmission from amygdala is reduced and including to the BST. So we look at this. So we uh, injected the channel dopsin in the amygdala, then we um, reduce, uh, induce the optical uh, currents in the uh, BST to look at you know, synaptic transmission in this pathway. So first of all, we found that uh, optically induced synaptic uh, response is uh, reduced in the CSD mice, uh, but a parapause ratio is increased. So parapause ratio is inversely correlated with uh, re uh, presynaptic release probability. So this suggests that presynaptic release reduced, therefore leading to a reduction of a synaptic transmission in this pathway. And this um, change in synaptic transmission is uh, um, dependent on the mitophagy pathway. So in pink one knockout mice, um, the CSD induced uh, change in synaptic transmission is abolished. And when we um, inject the pink one SRA into the amygdala, we also abolish the CSD induced effect on uh, synaptic transmission. The thirty days. Yes. Sorry. Once the jet research after the thirty days, the coronary surgery is test for what's, what's the timing of the measure? Ah. Oh yeah, this is a thirty days after the CSD. Yeah. 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 Um. Okay. So now, okay. So now, as the last thing, we want to confirm if this uh, impression of the transmission is indeed responsible for the anxiety increase. So we um, again we inject the CRHR2 in the amygdala, then we uh, deliver light stimulation to increase activity in this uh, projection, and then we found that when we uh, give a light, we can um, um, suppress anxiety in defeated mice in both open field and elevated zero maze test. Okay, so this is basically the summary of this part. What we find: uh, chronic social defeated stress cause mitochondrial damage uh, selected in amygdala. Mitochondrial damage then leads to increase in mitophagy. And then also we find this uh, increase of biogenesis, which I didn't show you the data, but the biogenesis increase is minor. So it's not sufficient to compensate for the increase in mitophagy. So the net result is there's a reduction of mitochondria 
therefore lead to reduction in synaptic transmission between BLA and BST to increase anxiety. One question is the time scale, because you have seen these at 10 days. Yeah. So we yeah. assume that mitophagy, once it gets going, is going to be sort of a steady state. Does this mean that somehow without transcriptional changes or anything else, mitophagy just maintained over these 30 days and reaches a threshold? Or is there some sort of differential between the transcriptional state of the cells that then reinforces the mitophagy to get to a threshold for the changes? That's a great question. Um, so we know that the mitophagy happens uh, late. So when we look at the mice defeated for 10 days, we don't see mitophagy change. So perhaps they need a, a mitochondrial damage accumulate to a certain level to trigger mitophagy. And it, you don't need to invoke any transcriptional change. That we didn't look at. Whether it's a maintenance need a, a transcription, we don't know. And also another re related question is if this, this is reversible. Um, yeah, that's one of the yeah, right. Yeah, that that's that's all the great questions that yeah we want to know. Yeah, uh, artificial inhibition that circuits from the BLA to BNST. You can see how the mitochondria quantity quality has been changed in under that one. Um, we didn't look at that experiment. Um, oh, actually, we. We didn't look at that way, but we look at this way, we block uh, activity in this pathway using DRAD during the CSD. So when we block um, activation of this pathway, you know, this, uh, during this uh, CSD exposure, you know, these 30 days, we can uh, prevent mitochondrial damage and metology. That, that, that we look at that way, yes, right. Um, so have you looked at changes in mitochondrial patient? No. Mitochondria become fragmented. I didn't say that, but we, we do see mitochondria become fragmented. Um, but it's a fission or fusion that, yeah, that's an yeah, quite interesting question, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now put everything together. So we think mitochondria are really important for synapses, and they really have multiple functions in synapses. So from our study, it appears that mitochondria sit at the crossroads of new activity. So they respond to different kinds of neural activity to initiate different signaling. So when there's low frequency stimulation, they activate task spaces to um, regulate synaptic strengths. When there's a high frequency activity in the gamma range, uh, they undergo fission to increase the synaptic ATP supply. Uh, when there's a psychological stress, uh, they um, undergo mitophagy to adjust total mitochondria amount. Um, and that has effect on anxiety. Okay, last one. Okay, so this is the um, acknowledgements. I want to thank all the people in my lab, current members and uh, former lab members who have contributed this work. And uh, especially I want to thank our um, collab dear collaborators, you know, Ron Pachali and Yasin Wang. They are our EM people uh, and they have retired recently. So I really um, hope they enjoy their retirement. And also these all kinds of NIH core facilities, they have been supporting us for over the year and the work is supported by the IMH uh, intramural program. Thank you for your attention. All the questions. I look for more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. A couple of minutes, we have a couple of questions online. Oh, okay. yes. uh, one question from Lee Shang. So activation of cast spaces by the translocation of BAD in the mitochondria inhibits autophagy without activating our apoptosis, why? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we tested that. So we think that it's a two, two, at least a two factor. One is the level activation. Another one is the kinetics. So it has to be have a higher level of activation. Also has to be a, a prolonged activation of this pathway, cast space, lead to prolonged and high level of cast space activation is required for cell deaths. And in this case, we have a transient and a low level activation of time space. So that is not sufficient to induce cell deaths. Mm -hmm. uh, Shannon Ferris said, uh, lovely talks, all right, could be there in person. With regards to the fission experiment, some data in cultured hippocampal neurons suggest that activity induces fission and that fission is required for structural plasticity. 
So have you tested whether your light-induced mitovision model also induces LTP or otherwise impacts the plasticity mechanisms? That's that's a good question. No, we haven't tested. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then she goes on, uh, Shannon again says, your story of certain specific impairments in mitochondria is really cool. You mentioned that neuronal compensation of mitochondria is one mechanism for specific circuits to be spared by mitochondrial dysfunction in the Parkin null mice. So do you think that's a general mechanism for neuronal susceptibility in psychiatric disease like schizophrenia? That could be. And also, I think that, um, at least in our case, has a lot to do with the, the paradigm we use, how do we uh, stress the animal. In this stress model, is uh, primarily fear. And we know amygdala you know, is the, the major you know, region to mediate the fear response. So if we use other, there could be uh, circuit selectivity. Um, if you use other, you know, maybe other circuits are more vulnerable if you use other paradigm. Yeah. I'll do one last question on my friend, Chris Thompson. That excellent presentation. Many studies have shown that neurons in the amygdala can have a very heterogeneous response to stress, with some neurons decreasing rather than increasing dendritic length, for example. How universal are these changes in mitochondria morphology and function across different parts of the amygdala? That's a great question. So um, we also wonder about that. So we look at um, BLACA. Um, and uh, we find kind of uh, uh, same uh, observation, but we haven't looked into the, the cell type. The question exactly is right. There are many different cell types that express different uh, cellular markers, um, so they could have different responses. Um, the one that the mitochondria YP we use is a pan-neuronal um, promoter, so it's in all neurons, but it could, could, could be that different cell type have a different response. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, yeah, so uh, great talk. Uh, from your first part of the talk, I was wondering uh, that uh, since your model is that caspase is affecting the recycling of MPI receptor, why doesn't it affect the LTP? Does it affect LTP? Um, so this pathway is not activated by LTP uh, in the, um, in the um, I think it's a calcium <laughs> because uh, this pathway, because it's uh, activated uh, the, the casonorin, uh, the phosphatase pathway. In the LTP, it's a chem kinase 2. So chem kinase 2 and the, uh, the, the phosphatase, they are activated by different cal calcium uh, connectives. Uh, calcium so LTP has a high and a quick, the kinetics of calcium is different. Uh, and the LTD has a, a slower and a prolonged calcium. So the kinetics, like we talked with Mike earlier today, the kinetics of a calcium transient is important to determine the outcome. Yeah, on signaling, yeah. So we discussed this at breakfast a little bit, but in terms of mitochondrial heterogeneity, the selectivity in the for the chronic stress, do you think that's because the mitochondria in that subset of amygdala neurons are distinct molecularly, so that they in some way are a differential target for the signaling pathways that transduce the stressor, and that the mitochondria are actually more vulnerable? So, yes. you know, parts is not just parts. These are actually specialized. Yes, it, it can well be. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I, I certainly I believe, you know, mitochondria hom are not homogeneous in different cells. Yeah, yeah. Almost in both that, unless there was something else that was specific, because that's such a striking effect that you don't get it in the cortex. Yeah. You get it in the blood, and you don't get it in the cortex. So, it's really surprising to us initially, yeah. <laughs> it's surprising. And, so, yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that plays into the idea that there is mitochondrial mosaicism, and that mosaicism is actually a functionally essential part of differential bioenergetic support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. We, we certainly should investigate that, yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Yeah.